Good evening and welcome to the One Book, One Minnesota Statewide Book Club with Louise Erdrich, author of The Plague of Doves. The One Book, One Minnesota program is presented by the Minnesota Center for the Book in partnership with the State Library Service. I'm Elaine Hopkins, Director of Programs and Services for the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library, which is the Library of Congress designated Minnesota Center for the Book. As such, we present programming that reaches all corners of our state and promotes reading, libraries, and our state's literary legacy. As we get started this evening, we would like to take a moment to acknowledge the Dakota people, indigenous keepers of the land from which we broadcast tonight. The land was reserved by the Dakota in the Treaty of Traverse de Sioux, signed with the United States in 1851, and it remains sacred to them today. I also want to acknowledge the Ojibwe people, fellow indigenous inhabitants of this land. Dakota and Ojibwe people are also the original stewards of stories in this place now called Minnesota. And we at the Friends honor that tradition and the knowledge and values embedded in it as we work to lift up storytellers in our state today. We created One Book, One Minnesota with a network of library and educational organizations in April to bring Minnesotans together during a time of adversity and highlight the role of libraries in our communities. Since then, Minnesotans from nearly every county in our state have downloaded books by Minnesota writers more than 50,000 times. In the third chapter of this series, library patrons and readers have been reading and discussing The Plague of Doves since mid-October, and our event this evening has attendees from all over the state. The ebook and audiobook of The Plague of Doves are available for free download through Sunday, December 13th, and you can still visit thefriends.org slash onebook for that link and additional resources. You can purchase hard copies of The Plague of Doves and other works by Louise from Birchbark Books and other local independent bookstores. Our program this evening is being captioned by Christy Arntzen of Veritext. Thank you, Christy. I'd like to thank our partners, the Council of Regional Public Library Systems Administrators, HarperCollins Publishers, Minitex, a joint program of the University of Minnesota and the Minnesota Office of Higher Education, and the Minnesota Department of Education. This program is made possible in part by the state of Minnesota through a grant to the Minnesota Center for the Book through the Minnesota Department of Education. We want to hear how this program has affected you, so be on the lookout for a brief questionnaire and we'll send a link to the recording of today's event. Thank you all for being a part of this event today, and now I am honored to introduce our featured guest, Louise Erdrich. Louise is the author of 17 novels, as well as volumes of poetry, children's books, short stories, and a memoir of early motherhood. Her novel, The Round House, won the National Book Award for Fiction. The Plague of Doves won the Annisfield Wolf Book Award and was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. And her debut novel, Love Medicine, was the winner of the National Book Critics Circle Award. Her most recent novel, The Night Watchman, was released at the beginning of March this year. Louise has received the Library of Congress Prize in American Fiction, the prestigious Penn Saul Bellow Award for Achievement in American Fiction, and the Dayton Literary Peace Prize. She's an enrolled member at Turtle Mountain Bound Band of Chippewa and lives in Minnesota with her daughters. She is also the owner of Birchbark Books. Welcome, Louise, and thank you both for your work and for being here. Oh, and you were on mute. <laughs> yeah, my Oh, all right, here I am. <laughs> Thank you, miigwech, to everybody who is tuned into this tonight. I'm really happy to be here and um, I appreciate so much hearing the land acknowledgement. Louise Erndrick, Indigenous Kaz Jaganashmoen, Kaye, Kinewebik, Indigo, Makwanin Indodem, Mekanak Wujuing, Indunjiba. Uh, I am so looking forward to this conversation with you and we've got some questions that the audience has provided in advance and we'll also be taking questions from the chat so if you have questions um, for Louise about the plague of doves or other work you can put those questions in the chat and we'll get to as many as we can um, and then I think we have the special treat of hearing a passage from the plague of doves as well so just wanted to start off by asking how how are you doing during this this strange time well is there anyone who can really answer that in a real 
a real way, right? It's hard to answer. Um, some days are are all right, and then some days just seem all the days seem to last forever, but they are over very quickly. I think mm-hmm. that's one of the strangest things about this, how it's disoriented us and how it's disarranged our sense of time. Mm-hmm. We've been speaking with a lot of different writers um, at programs and writers from around the state, and um, everyone is feeling uh, different about how how inspired they are to keep up with their writing practice, people who cannot write, um, people who are taking refuge in writing. Have you felt that this has had an impact too on your on your writing life? I suppose it has, but I had to, I really had to change my um, idea of what I was going to work on because I spend a lot of time uh, interviewing and talking to people and I was going to be writing about the sugar beet uh, capital of the world, I suppose. Well, we're not quite, but the Red River Valley where I grew up and where I, um, my first job was hoeing sugar beets. So I, I was going to talk about that, but or, or re- write about that. But I couldn't really go and talk to my former classmates and people I wanted to see around um, Wahpeton. So I've been writing different things. Yeah. Huh. Well, we have asked you here to talk about the Plague of Doves. And um, I do want to set up the conversation with a little, with something that I found. This was on the Poetry Foundation's biography of you. And it was a quote from Elizabeth Blair. And she declared in The World and I that in an astonishing virtuoso performance sustained over more than two decades, Erdrich has produced interlinked novels that braid the lives of a series of fallible, lovable, and unpredictable characters of German, Cree, Meti, and Ojibwe heritage. And she continues that the painful history of Indian white relations resonates throughout her work. In her hands, we laugh and cry while listening to and absorbing home truths that taken to heart have the power to change our world. We listen because these truths come sinew stitched into the very fabric of the tapestry she weaves so artfully. And I just, when I read that, I was I was completely taken aback because that idea of a tapestry and the way that you weave stories and ideas and history all together um, was just so apparent in the plague of doves and um, and as we were communicating with um, with your readers about this event many many people wrote in about that idea of of how this book was woven together how it how it sort of pieced together in a way and I'd love to have you talk sort of about the structure of it and maybe interwoven with that is sort of a two-part two-part question um, that you have Evelina say at one point, I think of how history works itself out in the living. And I'm, I'm curious about how that idea feeds into how you might've structured the novel or how you did structure the novel. Thank you, that's a, that's a wonderful question. I mean, you've left me so many threads to to pull. Um, Why don't I start by talking about how I came up, how the book came about. And before I even start, I want to thank all of the people who've read the book. I think it's perhaps one of the more difficult books that I've, I've written. And I appreciate anyone who's come to the end of the book and found out this sort of solved the mystery that's within the book. I mean, everything that happens in some ways is mysterious, you know, but I know I, I didn't know in the very beginning that I was going to write this as a novel, but I knew there was something taking shape. And I, I kept writing the stories one after the next, you know, everywhere I looked, it seemed that I was seeing something where, history affected what was happening in the day to day, you know, in, in, in the present. And I, um, I, came, I, I came to it through some real events. I mean, the, 
the uh, the lynching was very close to an actual lynching in North Dakota. I think it was 1911. And um, one of the names, Paul Holytrack, is a real name. So there were things in it that hinged on, on pieces of history. Um, Town Fever was very, um, very much uh, part of my own background because the town that the town party uh, founded, or they, they wanted to found, is Wapaton, which is my hometown, right? Wapaton Breckenridge. And I've always been interested in that story. So as I was working on it, I began to get this sense that it was larger and it had to be put together. But when I finally came to putting it together, I had written all of the pieces in a kind of, um, without really looking at the timeline that was contained within them. So that the characters were maybe the same, but they were different ages and they were, <laughs> the years were different. And once I came to copy editing this, I have a wonderful copy editor, Trent Duffy. It was the most difficult experience of my life. I spent over a month just crawling around on the floor of my office because I had everything spread out on the floor, all the pages and things that went with another page and, you know, uh, post-its with years and, and, and whether what people looked like. I mean, I didn't have them the same when I wrote them the first time. It wasn't straight, a story that I wrote straight through. I had to bring it all back and tie it up. So threads is a very apt metaphor for this because I was weaving and uh, my fingers were frayed and my brain was completely um, coming apart by the end. It really was. Oh my goodness. I'm... <laughs> so I'm so glad that it's here in this, you know, <laughs> between covers and we can talk about it now mm -hmm. yeah oh I can I can only imagine that that feat of trying of trying to tie it all together um, after a point that's wonderful thank you very much so on uh, sort of along the lines of of um of how it was structured we're as readers following this this mystery and um you know, starting off with the murder, of course, and then the subsequent murders by lynching. And you you weave the the pieces and sort of like the hints of that of the mystery that we're following um, throughout the book with with all kinds of other injustices, big and small, um, that are committed against the the native people, particularly in the characters in your book. And that thought is tied again with something that you, Evelina, it was fantastic for all of these amazing quotes and ideas that have really stuck with me. And she says that now that some of us have mixed in the spring of our existence, both guilt and victim, there is no unraveling the rope. And since this book is, is the first of the um, sort of the loose justice tr trilogy, I'd, I'd love to have you speak a little bit about how you envision justice and the idea of reparations through this novel and, and your other work? I didn't know when I started it that there would be a trilogy oh. and that this is what I was really working on. And of course they are thematically but not connected but not in terms of an ongoing character development. Mm -hmm. so, um, I was exploring that idea of how we come to exact justice and how imperfect it is, you know, the various kinds of justice. And this one is very much about uh, rough justice, about vengeance and justice. And, you know, the, the thirst for justice is so closely linked with the, um, the wild vengeance that people take. And I find that one of the real paradoxes of our, our, our lives, you know, that, that we have this intense sense 
of order and justice so intense that people take it into their own hands you know and so um and it can be so wounding when justice is not applied and that's what the second book is about the ability the inability to find justice in a broken just system and then the third book of course which is la rose is about traditional justice and what how that plays out in an imperfect world uh so this book you know is it it started out i i don't i'm raising a lot of questions that i don't have the answers to and i'm i'm, I'm it's an ongoing search and i don't know exactly how you tease apart that rope that we were talking about how you can do it because a rope is a rope is it has to stay unified it has to stay together or it loses its strength and a lot of it was about our country and how we see justice and how we see the future and how we have to you know we have to stay knitted together on some level no matter how much we feel this um tendency to blame and exact revenge and the, the disarray that comes that comes to us in our lives because we we resent or or or, or we 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 have some idea that it doesn't you know that we've been wronged somehow so we have to we have to look at how to apply justice as best we can and you're talking about reparations uh in in uh native american life in our legal life that question is not so much a case of reparations it's a case of carrying out to the law our the treaties that were made between government government to government relation between native nations and the nascent united states now those treaties are some of the original laws of the land and so that's what native people that's our begin that be, that's what begins our sense of justice none of these treaties has been kept you know we're looking right now at a, a at treaties that were not kept here in minnesota and we have um a pipeline that is being built in an incredibly um it's it feels to me like one of the basic injustices is to 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 start building something right now during a time when people are suffering so much in a time where we've come through only the beginning of reckoning with our own senses of our own injustices after the George Floyd murder we have to reckon with all these things and all of a sudden this intense climate injustice is being raked up on native people and other inhabitants especially of the north country but it's upon the world because so we know this is like if minnesota was to build 32 coal fired power plants you know this is an enormous pipeline so you know what we see in the past is what happens in the present and it's going across unceded territory orig the original boundaries that were decided between um white earth nation red lake nation all the nations and the united states government so i think this has to be reckoned with all right right thank that was you a long answer <laughs> no it, that it was wonderful and i really i really appreciate that in that you know in 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 my head and wrapping it around that it, the restitution of of those those laws and those those original um yeah the original treaties not that idea the of treaties the treaties right yeah one you know, are those rights mm -hmm. that were that were um they were agreed upon because i mean everyone's living at, at the land acknowledgement it was so wonderful but everybody is living on the land and 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 so 
there there needs there has those treaties have to be kept kept mm -hmm. yeah i i just it's it's so fascinating to be thinking about the novel and to be talking you talking to you here and the that idea of the rope and and our needing to understand our history we are so reluctant we um i think the dominant white culture is so reluctant to really look at our history and we have to start we have to start there if we have any hope of understanding and um and moving forward but i so i went off on a little, little well, i think i think it's it's part of what you know it, it's part of what um you're doing and part of what we're doing is is looking at it and mm -hmm. you know, as we probably know from our own lives, the hardest thing for any one of us is to not look at a painful part of our lives and to, to ignore it, deny it, pretend it isn't there. It, it doesn't go away and it is there. And so the only thing to do really is to, is to try and understand it and to, to a, you know, we have to admit the imperfections. We have to admit the, the flaws in our country. We can't pretend that, that we don't make mistakes and terrible mistakes. We have to look at what happened. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm sort of going off on a, a little bit of a, of a side piece into one of the, um, one of the other threads that you have in the piece. And um, oh goodness, I'm well. <laughs> I'm I'm sorry. We have a we have an unexpected guest here, my darling. Um, so maybe I should quickly ask you to read the passage that we. Who was that? That's so sweet. Oh, well, um, I'll read this. <laughs> okay. That was my four-year-old son, David. But um, so I, we'd love to hear you read a passage and then uh, chat a little bit. Um, okay. after. I want to say too, the, the, it's not so bad to look at the past, mm -hmm. you know, it, it really isn't. And, and I think it would bring this, this enormous sense of, of um, together. I mean, I think we'd be, I think we'd feel better. I think we'd feel, all feel better. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Few men know how to become old. Shemengwa did. Even if Geraldine hadn't been his niece, I would have visited him. I admired him and I studied him. I thought I'd like to grow old the way he was doing it, with a certain style. Other than his arm, he was an extremely well-made old person. Anyone could see that he had been handsome and he still cut a graceful figure, slim and medium tall, his fine head was covered with a startling mane of thick hair, white. He was proud of it. And every few weeks, he had it carefully trimmed and styled by Geraldine, who still traveled in from the family land just to do it. He was fine looking, yes, but there are other things about him. Chimangwa was a man of refinement who practiced clean habits. He prepared himself carefully to meet life every day. Ojibwe language in several dialects is spoken on our reservation, along with Cree and Michif, a mixture of all three. Oeji is one of the words used for the way men get themselves up, neaten, scrub, pluck stray hairs, brush each tooth, make precise parts in our hair, and these days press a sharp crease down the front of our blue jeans in order to show that although the government has tried in every way possible to destroy our manhood, we are undefeatable. Oeji, we still look good and know it. The old man was never seen in disarray, but yet there was more to it. He played the fiddle. How he played the fiddle. Although his arm was so twisted and disfigured that his shirts had to be carefully altered and pinned on that side to accommodate the gnarled shape. Yet he had agility in that arm and even strength. With the aid of a white silk scarf, which he chose to wear rather than just any old rag, 
Shemangwa tied his elbow ever since he was very young into a position that allowed the elegant hand and fingers at the end of the damaged arm full play across the fiddle's strings. With the other hand and arm, he drew the bow. And here I come to some trouble with words. The inside became the outside when Shamangwa played music. Yet inside to outside, outside does not half sum it up. The music was more than music at least what we are used to hearing. The music was feeling itself. The sound connected instantly with something deep and joyous. Those powerful moments of true knowledge that we have to paper over with daily life. The music tapped the back of our terrors too. Things we'd lived through and didn't ever want to repeat. Shredded imaginings unadmitted longings, fear, and also surprising pleasures. No, we can't live at that pitch. But every so often, something shatters like ice, and we are in the river of our existence. We are aware. And this realization was in the music somehow, or in the way Shemingua played it. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm so grateful for you reading that, that passage. We had so many readers who, who sent in questions or comments. And even tonight, people are commenting about the violin and Shemengwa and the, the fact that this is yet another of those, those threads that you weave throughout the entire, um, entire novel. And they were just so moved by um, by that story. Can you talk a little bit about um, the, the music, the sort of story of Shemengwa's violin and, and how that, that came to you? Well, um, it came from a, so many different directions. I had a very dear friend who told me about a man who had this twisted arm, but I didn't realize for a long time. And then my mother told me this story about a little boy who would go out into the woods. He, he would be punished for playing the violin. And I had to figure out a reason for why that would be. And so he went out into the wind. And then I started hearing, listening to, um, uh, the Turtle Mountains has wonderful musicians wonderful musicians. And uh, I started listening to the accounts of some of the, the older musicians who talked about learning songs from the wind and learning songs from birds and you know, learning songs from music from the world around them. And all of that went into it. And I don't know where the, the fiddle coming to its, to its person really came from, you know, uh, this, this fiddle having its own life or existence. But um, at the time I was studying the Ojibwe language, I'm very rusty now, but I, I was really, really trying. And, you know, I, I began to think because uh, in, in Ojibwe, things are animate or inanimate. And it's not like in French, for instance, where things are fem masculine, feminine, or, um, but life, it, it, life, um, life is in many things that are unexpected, like stones and like um, trousers. And so, some things are animate and some aren't. And there really isn't exactly uh, an explanation, but just the fact that one is animate and one isn't would, would make me really think about how there is life in so much that we think of as lifeless. And then I loved, I, I love reading about violins. I, I really love the 
kind of the mystique that has grown around special violins and, and how they begin to conform to the artist, you know? I, so part that's partly where it came from. I, I, that's it. All the stories come from so many different directions. I'm, I'm trying to think of all the directions. I don't know. I imagine, uh, oops. Um, I imagine that that uh, would also be kind of like trying to track the chronology that you were talking about earlier, <laughs> sort of with the, over the course of your writing career and all of these different um, post-it notes <laughs> sort of across your life. Um, yeah, I, I really, my life really is a series of post-its all <laughs> over the walls and everything. It just, yeah. Um, so we have, you know, I, I think that there was, there were several questions where people were asking, it's a little bit of a tangent, but maybe sort of, you know, from the violins and, and the story and where it came from. Research has come up in so many people's questions um, about how, and you were talking about with the, you know, wanting to write about the sort of the, the sugar beet capital. Um, how how do you go about your research? And there was a specific question where someone was wondering, particularly in the Meti community, and that's a, a difficult or a difficult concept, even I think, for people to to grasp a little bit about how how the Meti um, community is and came about. And and so there was specific question about that, but then also research more more generally how how you see that um, as a part of your process. So um, the, the, the Métis community is um, a very separate culture in its own right and uh, with um, its own language, Mitchif or Métis, and um, the, that language is Cree and Ojibwe and French. And it really arises out of the fur trade when French voyageurs came over and they would marry into a powerful Ojibwe family or Cree family in order to um, sort of facilitate trade. I mean, I'm sure there was love too. And I used to kind of say, and the Ojibwe really improved the French in terms of looks. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that happened too. And now, you know, lots of good looking people running around. Anyway, um, so I don't know. My grandmother um, was Metis and then Scottish because a lot of Scottish people also settled in the Red River Valley. But she really didn't talk about it or she was married to my grandfather. His family had come over from Red Lake and he was the one who spoke Ojibwe. So that was his, um, you know, his influence was, was actually much more from Red Lake. And so I became very curious about that part of, of the family because I didn't know a lot. And so I, I, um, I looked at it more closely, but also I was fast, I, my mother, um, you know, I was raised a, a Catholic. And my grandfather was both Catholic and he was very um, intensely religious in a, in, in, he was part of the Ojibwe religion, the Mede. So he, he would bring both together. I mean, he would bring his medicine bundle to mass, which, you know, he thought every, he thought everything should be the same. There was one God, one spirit, one presiding one one presiding infinite um uh, unencompassable spirit running through everything and he he um so so he had both practices so religions to me are practices but um uh i was fascinated because in some in some cases people who were intensely religious in their, um, in their tribal life would also be at mass. So I thought that was incredible, you know, and, and being raised in a Catholic sense too, and um, sort of liking the, 
the drama of Catholicism was part of this. You know, there's that place where um, Evelina sees her her boy the, the boy she's madly in love with, and their glances come together, and they have just had communion. You know, in that that sort of <laughs> that sort of rarefied purity that you're supposed to be imbued with at that moment. Yeah. That, yes, that was that was marvelous. As someone who has been in plenty of uh, Catholic masses, uh, that resonated with me <laughs> as well. <laughs> so, um, I I love that in your answer about the research, you got into family history, and that is so so important, of course, in I think all of your work. And several of your readers were just in awe of of how. You have characters, you know, going into one one story and the next, and and moving in and out of various novels. And practically speaking, do you have to map out the genealogies of everyone to keep them straight? Uh, well, here is where Trent Duffy comes back in. <laughs> so he has been working with me on these books as a copy editor. He's in New York, and um, he's just a lovely man. And he's very meticulous. He's the opposite of me. My research, oh, I didn't quite say is, uh, is it's kind of omnivorous. It's like I'm plodding, I'm, I'm lumbering around in my forest of books and just picking and choosing and chomping down. And I, you know, I really, sometimes it's all seems like pure chance, how I come, you know, the, the, way, the way I come across some piece of, of knowledge that I want to include. But Trent, way back when, began this, um, began this computer program that, that took all of the characters and he put it into his computer. And I don't know exactly what it looks like, but he's got them in there with all of their characteristics and the years they lived. And, everything the year that things happened to them so that he can tell me if if i'm i'm going wrong in some sense with a character that's in, enlarging or repeating um but in this case even trent i mean it was <laughs> it was like a if you had the finest string imaginable and you just jammed everything together and then you tried to pull everything out, that's what this book was like. So he had trouble too. We, we just all had trouble. Well, it's um, complicated. Yes, I have that takeaway as a reader, but but not jumbled and not not all tangled. I mean, only, only tangled, tangled in a good way, I think. I think, we got it, I think we got it straightened out, yeah. 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 That's marvelous. So um, there was a question from one of our attendees here tonight, and and I love this question because it's I feel it, you know, even though we're in totally separate places, but just in our conversation um, about your humor and how you use humor. I mean, there are there are so many important and weighty ideas and thoughts and again you know tragedies that occur in your novel I mean in human life and so therefore in your novels but your humor is also another one of those threads that weaves through um, as this as it was put here in a delightfully subtle way and so our our listener here was wondering if you use it as a tool or does it just find its way in because of who you are I don't have a lot of control over it, but when I'm stuck, I think the only way to get out of this is funny. You know, <laughs> so a lot of the time, um, that's what will happen. And I come from this family where <laughs> almost anything can be funny. You know, I, I'm, I'm so fortunate in my family because I think we laugh more than most families. And things are funnier and, and we're very, we love to kind of make fun of ourselves and to um, sort of notice things 
that strike us as funny. You just notice. And, and also that's a very Ojibwe trait. You know, if, if one is at a Ojibwe meeting or a language table, it might be serious, but it also, you can hear the laughter and all the way down the halls, you know, it, it's that kind of thing. So yeah, I, I think funny is the hardest thing to write. I think violence is the easiest thing to write. I think kindness is the, is very difficult as well. So um, that's what I think. Oh, thank you. No, I, I, I like that. Um, I, you mentioned your family and there was another question and, and I've, I've had the privilege of, of working with, with both your sisters um, as they're also in, in the literary world. And do you ever think, or do, do you all talk about how it is that, that all three of you have forged paths in, in the literary world? Is, does that tie back to how you grew up and, or traditions or? I, I think we're influenced by our parents to a, an enormous degree, you know, um, they, they're living in, in North Dakota as, as right now. And I, I think their, their sense of humor, their storytelling, their, um, their lifelong relationship and their insistence that we all are, I, I know we, we get along with, one another. And I don't know many families where it's just always that way that everybody gets along. And we, we do. And I, you know, uh, and I'm, I'm kind of astounded by my sister Lisa led by her, her, her prose. It just, it absolutely makes me shiver. It's so good. And, and she was always from the beginning kind of picked out as the one who has the most incredible ability. She's an amazing person. She is a phenomenal writer. And so is my sister Hyde, a poet. I mean, I her book, Little Big Bully, is one of my fav favorite books that I think I've ever read. And so is Night Train. I mean, they're my favorite books. You know, they, they, they're wonderful writers. And my sister Angela is a tremendous um, artist. And she's illustrating a book. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, the book's by Denise Lajan Madeer, and it's going to be a beautiful children's book. Oh, wonderful. Well, I will have that to look forward to, too. Um, and, you know, you mentioned Hyde and, and being primarily a poet, although she also- Oh yeah, she's a essayist and yeah. Yeah, In, and you do. And do you find that, I mean, you have such a lyrical style of writing and it's so very evocative. Do you, do you feel that, that your poetry writing influences that in any way? Or, or is there sometimes a, a sort of a faint line between <laughs> prose and poetry for you? Or how do they, how do you approach um, sort of both of those writing disciplines? I don't, I don't really have any control over it. So if I have infrequently have a poem that it's as though it wants to write itself mm -hmm. and that's how it happens. I don't really, I'm not able to sit down and write a poem. I don't have the discipline of poetry, I, I can sit down and write prose. And I can sit down, you know, a lot of the time I can write for a long time and just realize I've gotten nowhere and get rid of that writing. Cause it's just writing until something connects and catches. Mm -hmm. um, but but that's, that's kind of the craft of it is, is that I, I have to, I have to be in one place. I mean, I had this wonderful teacher who was an art teacher and said something like, you just have to leave the door open. You can, you can work away at something, but just leave the door open for something really to crash in on you. And that's, 
on the best days, that's what happens. And that's, I think that line about suddenly you're in the river of existence. That's what happens when you're, you know you're writing something funny or something moving or something that's gonna surprise people. That's, oh, I love that. Um, you mentioned place in, in how you were, you were talking about your writing just there. And, and we've had a, a question from an attendee here about place. And, um, and again, it's so vivid in you, you know, when we're reading your novels, place is like, like another character. Um, and mm -hmm. when you're writing, do you, in order to sort of create that magic, do you have to be in a, in a particular place or is it, or is it more, more that mental place with the door open? I think I have to be in the, you know, in North Dakota or Minnesota, or maybe by Lake Superior or someplace around here, Canada, you know, I have to be in this circle mm -hmm. um, that goes sort of all the way to Montana and then over to Lake Superior. So I have to be in there somewhere. That's how it feels to me. Okay. Marvelous. Um, so we are getting we are getting tons of different different questions oh, and um, sort of all, all across the board. I know it's really it's it's exciting. Um, and one of the things that has come up a couple of different times, um, both uh, in question in advance and tonight, is the idea of the snake handling and the serpents and Marn Wold and that very speaking about <laughs> poetics I mean Marn's whole section was it, it did feel like a, a big long poem in in some way to me as I was reading it um, but we'd love to know uh, myself included um, where where that came from or um, or what inspired that that aspect I do not know, but I do know <laughs> that I've had people kind of look at me. <laughs> I mean, I, I, um, I mean, I'm in an ordinary life, and I remember that there was another mom who had just finished this book, I guess, and she was looking at me, and we had our little girls together, and she looked at me, and she said something like, "It must be unique living in your head." This it must be unique. I knew that's a Minnesota. That's it's like I can't even address it. it the word it's unique. <laughs> and so, yeah, where did that come from? I happen to be I I'm terrified of spiders, but I really like snakes. Except I don't like um point, you know, like pit vipers <laughs> I, I, i'm really scared i <clears throat> i don't want to be around a fertilette snake mm -hmm. i don't want an aggressive snake around me but i really like i really love snakes so i wasn't that didn't really feel scary to me or whatever i knew it was weird for some people but warren was weird i mean i had to let her have her her, her strangeness, you know? Yeah. And, to, and she, oh, she does come back in La Rose oh. as the mother of, of um, one of the characters. So she does kind of, she gets back there. <laughs> and I loved her being at the Four Bs. Uh, I used to go to a place called the Four Bs when we lived in Montana. And I thought this place, I, I know something's going to come of this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, so just having her escape to the four Bs, I don't know. So this, this might be akin to asking, you know, which of your children is your favorite, which, you know, is an impossible, is an impossible question to answer. Do you have, there's so many characters in the Plague of Doves. Do you have any that you would say, just are either your your favorite for some reason or or a character that you sort of that's still very present for you um so i think what uh, i might my numbers might be off but 12 years later um is it oh my 11 God. or 12 something anyway. 
Well, um, no, it wouldn't be like asking about my children. They're in a whole other, whole yeah. other, <laughs> right? But I know for you too. Um, but I liked, I think um, I liked writing about Musham. I, I don't know. I just, I felt like he kind of gave me the freedom to, to um, not just tease, but actually push, <laughs> push the story over the edge. You know, that's what he would do. <laughs> he pushes that story right over <laughs> the liver eating Johnson. You know, I enjoy just, and that's a, um, you know, the, some of the things in here, um, mustache mod, real, you know, there's people from uh, North Dakota history. And I, I wanted to kind of get back at liver eating Johnson and have, have Musham bite him, you know, so. Um, I, Musham definitely, I, I loved Musham as well. And many, many people have, have remarked that he is their favorite character. Oh, good, uh, good. So I've got a, a, another little bit of a, of a switch in the road, a question from an audience member and um, wondering if, has the publishing landscape changed in perceptible ways for Native authors in the period that you've been really a cornerstone of it? Um, we, you know, the, the audience member says that they like to think that it's easier for BIPOC voices to break out now compared to say in 1990, but, but I don't know. Um, I think there is this enormous, I, I'm so excited about this because, you know, there's Laylee Long Soldier, there's um, Natalie Diaz, there's Tommy Orange, um, there's Eric Gansworth, Billy Ray Belcourt, um, oh my gosh, um, Tanya Tagak, um, uh, oh, uh, Therese Mal. There's so many, there's so many wonderful writers. Um, oh, Cherie Dimoline. I mean, there's just these wonderful native writers, these young writers. I'm so excited about them. And I'm sorry for anybody I, 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 I'm left out of that because we're seeing this. I mean, I'm seeing a very exciting time for native writing and people who are writing out of their their um, tribal traditions. Um, and I mean, Scott Mamaday is still writing. He's, you know, it's, it's, it's very, Gerald, Gerald Visner, Gerald Visner. Oh my, um, oh my gosh. Um, Denise Sweet. You know, there's so many wonderful, wonderful writers. And here, right in, in, in this area, Marcy Rendon and her terrific mysteries. I just can't, there's so many people, so many wonderful writers. So I'm seeing that as, as um, it, it's dramatically different from late eighties, early nineties, way back then. Uh, I, it was very hard to get published at all. And there really was this sense that we once had a native writer and that's it. You know, we're not gonna, it was not, um, it, it was difficult. And I'm, I, I know this, I'm looking back at my, I was looking back at some of the letters. I mean, I have like stacks of rejections. And um, one of the rejections said, I don't, there's something that rings false about the intelligence of your characters. As though, you know, there was a lot out there that I just couldn't believe that I, um, that, you know, you really had to contend with this I idea that the stereotypes of who Native people were, were so rigid. Um, yeah, so it's, it really is exciting now. And so I, I just hope everyone who's just go on to read other writers. It's one of the exciting things about having um, Birchbark books is that our shelves are so packed. We have so many marvelous writers. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're a general bookstore, but that's our law, our, our great mission and our love. Right. The, um, I think you'll be pleased to know that the, the chat was just blowing up with people requesting that we 
um, transcribe the list of authors that you just mentioned. Seriously? <laughs> oh, thank you, everybody. That is the greatest thing to hear. Um, uh, we will. Uh, we can go back and <laughs> let's Elaine. Let's actually um, let's actually collaborate uh, with an email so that I can get them all in. All I just have to do is like look down this stack of books by my bed. I mean, oh my God, we, it's such a great stack. Oh, good. Well, that is that is a plan, and we can communicate it to everybody who registered for this event. So yeah. everyone will be Thank able to get that, that list of writers. Um, I had a question, and then that just went right out of my head. Oh, I know what it was. <laughs> Sorry. So there was a question from um, from Lyle, and he's someone who met you six or eight years ago at Turtle Mountain, and he was remembering that you had a lot of insightful questions about the 1918 pandemic, mm. and not many people at that time were thinking about that era of our history until now. It's, of course, really present for everyone, um, and so he's wondering if you're giving any thought to writing a novel based on or continuing with the, the pandemic that we find ourselves in or the previous pandemic? You know, I have places in the book where the pandemic um, surfaces, uh, but, but for native people, one, there, was there has never almost ever not been a pandemic. I think that's important to understand that nine out of 10, Native people died of old world diseases. You know, um, an unimaginable world. If we think about our, 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 our groups of 20 people and having only two people survive, but um, the, the 1918 uh, pandemic hit people, hit Native people incredibly hard and if you if anybody um is interested in that pandemic one of the most i think i mean beautiful things come out of tragic things sometimes sometimes and brenda child um who's a professor at university of minnesota and who works with the national museum of the american indian and works with the Minnesota Historical Society in Mille Lacs has a, an amazing jingle dress exhibit. And the dress came out of the pandemic. So during that pandemic, um, a grandfather was, I mean, there's very there's versions of this story and it could have happened at Mille Lacs, it could have happened at Whitefish Bay in on, Ontario. But he, he had this dream because his, his beloved granddaughter was basically dying of the influenza. And his dream was that these women came out of the four directions dancing and they were wearing these dresses that had um, little metal cones on them. And when he woke up and, and that, that, that was healing, that was going to heal her. And when he woke up, he, um, he, he described it and that those dresses began to be made and she, the, the, the child survived after the dance started. So it became this, and as I think a lot of people in Minnesota know it as a healing dance, as something that is a healing, it's there to help other people. So jingle dancers are, you know, on the powwow circuit and everything, but the dance itself, if it's done in its traditional form, is really that that jingle that that music that mesmerizing sound is actually there to to bring life to you to heal you to bring you back so in some places you know women are jingle dancing for people during covid um jingle dancers went to the memorial uh the george floyd memorial jingle dancers are always kind of there and a jingle dress is another one of those things, but it is not just a thing, but it is alive, it is alive. And so the dance sort of tells you, the, the dress tells you 
when it wants to be inhabited. And I know that because I, I, I sometimes dance, but, um, and my daughters do, those dresses tell you when they want to go out there and help people. That's incredible. Thank you for sharing that story. That's just, yeah, that does, it does seem, you know, in, in my just sort of learning of it, the, that it embodies that idea of the inanimate and animate you were talking about in the land. Right, um, right. Yeah, that's I like I, my friend who made the dress for me. I feel her, her hand in it. You know, the, mm -hmm. the reality is that the person puts part of themselves into that too. Uh, but check out Brenda Child's mm -hmm. uh, exhibit. Oh, Extraordinary. Yeah. There's a dress made out of a police uniform. There's dresses made out of all sorts of creative mm -hmm. different substances. Okay. Well, there's another question, I think. <laughs> um, so I, there are, again, so many. This one has come up many times and it occurred to me too. And then I was a little hesitant about it, although I don't exactly know why. Do you want to talk about the doves at all? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So I might have put this, I've said this several times, so, but maybe not everybody's heard it, but one of the first pieces I wrote was, um, was the first chapter, maybe the plague of doves. And so it was um, taken by the New Yorker. And then there was a fact check and they are like formidable fact checker, fact checkers. It's, they're well known as fact checkers. And the, um, the fact checkers like, um, these are clearly pigeons. I said, yeah, they were, you know, passenger pigeons, of course. So, well, then it would be incorrect to call them doves. I'm like, you're seriously telling me to name this the plague of pigeons? <laughs> well, you know, you have, if it's, if it's, you've got to find me. And I, I already had one, one reference in newspapers, um, like 1860 or 70 newspapers of doves, because I knew the plague of doves was at, from an actual newspaper article, but I had to find more <laughs> in order to keep the word doves. And I did it. <laughs> to convince so the New Yorker. Came to, <laughs> research came to my aid because like, you would never read this book if it was plague of pigeons, would you? No. It, it does not have quite the same <laughs> ring. I'm not gonna <laughs> say that people would read it, but. <laughs> I think so. Oh, well, I would, I would love, this is not, uh, we didn't talk about the, that particular passage, but another sort of based in historical fact. Um, would you share another passage? You talked about the possibility of reading some of uh, Town Fever. Oh, sure. Okay. <clears throat> so, oh, I guess this is, um, this is, uh, so it's based on a, um, a town site, um, it was like a bunch of speculators who got together to go out and try to stake out their claims where they thought the railroad was going to pass, right? So they would stake out their claim and try to, then they would speculate in the land there and hope that the railroad crossed there. And if it did, then they would have the right to sell the land around it. Um, <laughs> so in, in my town, there's a little, there, there's a stone that commemorated this town site expedition. And the, I want to read something that is, oh, this is my, this might be too long. Um, all right. So these guys, they take off from St. Anthony. You know, this is right, be right before our state became a state. And there's a young man in them. His last name is Johnston. I think it's Daniel. But um, he has uh, the, the, um, the Botnos were guiding this expedition. I'll just read part of it. Um, so the emissary, the most devout among the men were Henri and Lafayette Peace, who wore, it was revealed, 
once the men had stripped down to only two shirts during a warm February day, a crucifix at each next to their skin. They were Métis. They had an interesting way of doing things, thought Joseph. For instance, to get buffalo, they'd slip in among a small herd that ventured near, wearing wolf skins draped over their heads and shoulders. As there were always wolves scouting the herds, the bulls stepped near the men and smelled their caps, which must have made them think the guides were dead wolves. The buffalo turned away and lowered their great muzzles into the snow to forage for grass. Once close to the animal they'd chosen, one of the two brothers rose slightly and killed it, a single shot at close range, then instantly sank down. Keeping their gun locks dry under the wolf skin, the guides kept still until the animals, who shifted uneasily at the noise but never panicked, went back to stirring through the snow. Joseph was close enough to see that beneath the wolf skins, both men made the papist sign of the cross, kissed their crucifixes, and in their stillness, he could ascertain that they were giving thanks and praise to God. They loved their fiddle and called her their sweetheart, their lovers. But on Sundays, she was the Virgin Mary. They played only sacred music. And no matter what the circumstances, they always fished out their rosaries first thing in the morning and muttered as they moved their fingers along the beads. Well, I'm gonna stop there because it just goes on and on and I, I don't know where else to stop. But this, but so what really happened was that these two guides really saved these men. I mean, they nearly starved to death. They ate all of the food that they're, they brought for their oxen and then they ate the ox and then they began to starve and they were holed up on the Red River and then the Red River flooded. You know, I never, it was, they took exactly that route on that's 94 now. That was an old route. Like a lot of the places that we, you know, our highways are actually ox cart routes. That that makes so much sense. And I have to say that I was driving to Fargo relatively recently and I had, you know, I had read the book by then. This was only a couple of weeks ago. And I was thinking about that journey and I was thinking about the blanket. And I just yeah. really couldn't stop thinking about the blanket as I was driving to Fargo. And as you, every, I mean, maybe not everyone, but many people will know, there are just these huge expanses, yeah. you know, that you're, that you're, as you're making your way down 94. And I, I really couldn't stop thinking about the blanket um, from, from that, that journey. That, well, that you, you know, that place that was, you get 210 and then there's a road that goes to Wapton or Fargo. Mm -hmm. The, that's where the worst, the worst blizzards and, and the worst weather comes. In fact, my daughter and I were in two tornadoes right around there, right by Dalton and Ashby. Yeah. Anyway, um, the, in this in this story, that you know, it's it's set right there. And when you get into a blizzard there, there's many a time I've had to get off the road and and stay in Fer Fergus Falls or just mm -hmm. you know. Try to wait it out. Yeah, yeah. So that's still there. Um, so I think that we'll just go with um, a couple of others, and and this one is a, again slightly off the track from the plague of doves, but but people are really um, fascinated and and interested to hear you talk a bit about your work for children, um, and and maybe sort of what the inspiration was for deciding to write for children, um, which came, I think, many novels, you know, adult novels into, into your writing life. Well, um, The Birchmark House was an enlargement of a story that I started telling my daughters, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. But I kept going and part of it, you know, if my mom is anywhere watching, she knows, I think. It's because I have a lot of sex, violence, strangeness, mystery, and whatever in my books. And so I wanted to read some, to write something that um, 
would would just be about a world that might have sorrows and but you know like it would be for children and it would it would make my family happy as well the children and everybody else you know so that's you know that's why then then they wouldn't have to think about the snakes and the snakes under the pillows and everything <laughs> You know, there would also be this other world with its mm -hmm. own problems, mm -hmm. but it wouldn't have like, uh, you know, all of that in it. Right. Right. <laughs> That's, thank you. So, That's and I've enjoyed writing them. Yeah. Uh, I have several more to, to write. So I've, I've got to get back to work on them. Oh, wonderful. Well, we have we have had several people asking if you would like to give any teasers out about what's next. We know about the sugar beets potentially um, and, and something there. But do you well, I, mean, I know some writers don't don't share what they're what they're working on. or planning. I don't until I'm I'm I have to be like I have to hit page 300 and then I can talk about it. So I will talk about it. But it is um, a book that turns out to be about hauntings and ghost stories. And so I'm just, I'm just collecting a lot of, uh, but it's a novel, but it's about a haunting. And it's set here, but here's the crazy thing. I've been working on this book since 2014, right? And every year I think, I thought, well, I have to, I'm gonna start over because it starts on All Souls Day. And I go, I'm gonna write straight through and anything that happens, I'll have to put it in because it's set here. I started in 2019. And what happened? You know, I, I mean, I restarted it. I already had it half written, but then, ugh, this is really difficult. Every time, every year so far, it had been, I couldn't handle what happened. And I certainly can't handle now. So I don't know. If, I don't know what's going to happen to this book. Oh, goodness. Yeah. Huh. I'm trying to finish it, but it has ghosts. So it was a haunting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, after everything, we had our, you know, everything closed down. Mm -hmm. I really felt this sense of being haunted. And this sense that we have this invisible, um, th this 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 invisibility that's around. We have to try and keep everybody safe, and it's like we're all haunted. And it's also there's so much mystery and sorrow, and and we're so overwhelmed, and our medical people are so overwhelmed, and. Um, it's it's just a very it's a haunting time it will haunt us and um you know everything that happened in minneapolis the protests the murder everything that's happened in minneapolis this will this will haunt us we're already haunted right but i hope i can so this is a real challenge you know to put any sense of humor into it it's a big challenge I tell you I would imagine, yes. Oh goodness, it was a big challenge. If I can, if I can put anything into it that's at all funny, I will feel like I've accomplished something. Well, um, I think that we we will all be looking forward to it. I think um, you know there have been so many comments, and and I feel like I feel like that was a sort of that idea of being haunted, and it's 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 something that certainly was again part of the plague of doves and the reading and just the the whole experience of talking to you about this book and talking to writer or to readers all around the state that I really love taking away that idea that we're haunted, which haunting doesn't always have to be bad, right? You can oh, be haunted no. by history, you no, can be haunted. Fact, there's a very haunt, there's a very sexy ghost that comes back. <laughs> <laughs> well, we will look forward. We will look forward to that one. But the, you know, so many people have commented too in the chat about, you know, that that experiences like this, being able to hear from you and and get your thoughts and perspective and just your your take on on writing and life right now is a gift. And um, 
and that 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 shines a light in these sort of haunted times and um so thank you very very I'm much kind of, kind of everyone to tune in yes. um, well i you know we also get this little a very different glimpse of one another throughout this so i i appreciate some we, we, we have to try and find some things to, to appreciate right we do we do, and I, I would agree that this is one of them. Um, so thank you again. Thank you, thank you all. <clears throat> I, I want to thank everyone uh, who has been a part of this program tonight. I would also remind everyone that you can still download a, a free copy of the, um, of the book, The Plague of Doves. If you are inspired by tonight's program to read it, we did give some things away, but not too much. And uh, the audiobook and ebook are available through Sunday, um, this Sunday, December 13th, um, on eBooks Minnesota. So, on behalf of the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library, as the Minnesota Center for the Book and State Library Services, a huge, huge thank you again to Louise Erdrich, to our wonderful audience, and all of our program partners. You can sign up for our e-news um, at The Friends by visiting www.thefriends.org and you can keep up to date on all our other virtual author programs. We have a lot to look forward to in the new year, including, I will say, a reading from Hyde who will be um, reading yeah. from her new book, Little Big Bully. So you've got an endorsement from her sister here this evening. Um, I am, I am leaving this program with um, just an even greater appreciation of the novel and your work and um, all of the thoughtful readers that we have in our state. So thank you again and good night. Uh, thank you for being a part of One Book, One Minnesota. Bye. <laughs>